Welcome, friends, to another episode of Presbyterians in Quarantine Drinking Coffee. I'm your moderator, Mark Mernan, and I am here broadcasting from a, a secret location, the Bat Cave, far below stately Wayne Manor. I'm joined once again by my regular co-host here, Andrew Jacobson from the library at Downton Abbey. <laughs> uh, Wes Lover, who appears to be down in the servants' quarters in Downton Abbey. <laughs> yeah. Good to have you gentlemen here again. We have a guest. Wes, why don't you uh, introduce our, uh, our fourth uh, coffee drinker here with us this afternoon? Yeah, so we have with us today um, Trevor Rayborn. Trevor actually crossed paths with me at Knox just for one class. I don't remember what class it was. I remember it was a church history class, um, oh. but it was my it was my first semester there, and he was just finishing up, I believe. And so he's a pastor of Morning Star Church in Vero Beach, which is an associate reformed Presbyterian church. Awesome! Did I, I get that all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. All awesome. good. Welcome, right. Trevor. Say hello. Show us your coffee cup there. Hey, so I got over here. Uh, this is what I drink out of when I'm at the church. Uh, a little beaker. <laughs> So for, for my uh, coffee drinking. There you, go. There you go. Welcome yeah. to the show. Great to have you with us here. So today's episode, gentlemen, interpreting scripture. We won't get into the big H word, hermeneutics, but we're going to mm -hmm. talk about we're going to talk about interpreting scripture. So Andrew, why don't you kick us off here? Uh, what, what what's your thoughts on uh, what's your thoughts on this here? Where are we going? Yeah. So when I was thinking of this episode, you know, we've been looking at the doctrine of revelation, general revelation, special revelation, uh, and some other things related to that. And now this, I'm trying to get us to be more practical and help people understand. So now that we know that the Bible is God's word, that it's sufficient for all of life and godliness, how do we mine it? How do we kind of dig into the scriptures to uh, taste and see that the Lord is good? Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it'd be helpful actually for us to start from actually a historical standpoint, because we're Presbyterians in quarantine drinking coffee or reform Presbyterians. That's a longer name that we had to, you know, mm -hmm. cut out for sake of the graphic. And it's very important for us to understand that in the history of the church, being able to have a personal copy of our Bible that we could read uh, as believers, that we could have uh, personal devotions and family worship with is something that was quite an anomaly in the 1600s because before it was, the, the church, the Roman Catholic church was the one who believed that they were the prime and sole interpreters of the scripture and that the lay people needed to come to them to understand the scriptures. But people like Luther, uh, like Tyndale, like Wycliffe sought to bring the, the book back to the people, bring the scriptures mm -hmm. back to the people through translation, through instruction, and even, you know, the printing press uh, was one of those things. And so we take for granted what they literally lost their lives for. Yeah. Uh, and so this is something that we don't want to take lightly. Uh, and it's something that we should think about very seriously. Mm -hmm. So you've just addressed from a historical standpoint, uh, Luther's uh, emphasis on uh, translating into the vulgar language, the common language here. Um, but you've also brought up uh, a principle here and indirectly here, a, the principle of private interpretation that each of us as part of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the priests, uh, the, the universal of all believers, you know, uh, priesthood of all believers here, that each of us is tasked with reading the scriptures and interpreting them ourselves. Are there some principles, uh, Wes, that you, uh, that you encourage your members to, uh, uh, to follow as they are reading the scriptures for themselves? Yeah. So uh, we, when we talk about in scriptural interpretation, we want to focus on what I would refer to as literal interpretation, or you could say taking a historical, literal, grammatical approach to the Bible. Uh, and what this means is literal comes from the word literary, and, and there are different genres of, of literature. There are different forms of mm -hmm. literature. And so strictly speaking, this means that we – interpret the the text in its literary form right that a, a noun is treated as a noun a verb is treated as a verb um, poetry is treated as poetry and all these different things right that our, our aim of interpretation is to interpret the bible in its literary form and then when we go talk about the historical context uh, we're trying to interpret what would this have meant to its original audience 
and in its original language, right? All these different things go into how we understand the Bible in its original literary form. Yeah. So, now, so you, now you, Trevor, you let me ask, can I ask, let me ask Trevor a question and fold you in. So Trevor, you have a member who comes to you and, you know, they're struggling with regular Bible reading or, you know, a discipline like that. How would you encourage them? And what would you say to them of why they should make regular Bible study and reading a, a spiritual discipline, a habit? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, number one, um, Jesus himself really shows us that knowing scripture is important. I mean, most mm. of the words he was repeating uh, from the scriptures that he had. And of course, when they talk about scriptures in his day was the Old Testament scriptures. Um, you know, I also remind my, you know, someone in that regards, uh, I believe it's what from uh, uh, Deuteronomy, where it kind of talks about we, we want to put the words of God on our posts uh, mm -hmm. as eyelets between our eyes. It uh, should be everywhere where we go. Um, so scripture is very important and should be a part of your daily routine. Uh, if you're new to reading scripture and you don't know where to start, uh, I almost kind of give the same prescription I give to a new believer um, because it's always good. I, I would say reading a chapter a day and starting off with the gospel of John really would be helpful. That's tw it's, it's a 21 day challenge when you think about it. And it does take time for habits to form. Some habits take longer than others, but reading the Bible a chapter a day, especially in the Gospel of John, I think is manageable if you're new to reading, mm -hmm. and uh, which would be a little bit better than asking a new believer, well, go start with Leviticus, you know, <laughs> and uh, tell me how you feel in about 40 days. You know, it, it, it's a different flavor. Uh, so that, that's what I would share mm -hmm. with someone who wanted a starting point. I think the Gospel of John a chapter a day, 21 day challenge. It's a great start to a Bible reading plan. Hmm. We've seen some of the benefit of that from, uh, from Andrew, uh, the ladies in our church have been gathering uh, for the past uh, several months, reading through the Bible. I think they've just finished the end of that. But let's address a topic here that, that uh, all of you were alluding to just a second ago, the idea of context. Mm -hmm. When we talk about context um, regarding scripture, uh, why don't you address some of the perspectives, some of the different angles of what context means, the context of the author, the context of the, uh, of the book you're in, of the, which, which testaments you're in, the context of the uh, uh, circumstances to which the uh, writer is addressing. Yeah. So, you know, there's the real estate maxim. The most important thing is location, location, location. So when you're reading <laughs> the Bible, the most important thing when it comes to what studying the scriptures literary wise is context, context, context. And so if you're in, for example, John chapter four, uh, the immediate context that you're in is uh, the, the, the chapter itself. And then the chapters before and after John chapter three, John chapter five. Well then, you know, think of it like concentric circles or like a Russian nesting doll. Well, the next context then is the book of the gospel of John. And then you have a John, the, the author of that gospel and his other letters. Then you have, uh, the New Testament, and then you have, you know, the whole scriptures. And so you, you want to zoom in to the most immediate context that has the most pressing, um, you know, statements on the interpretation. And then the further out you move, you know, the, the, the further way you get from the immediate context, the less pressing it is on the interpretation of the immediate text, uh, that kind of thing. So that's when we say literary context, we're thinking of mm -hmm. the book in its setting in scripture. Well, that, that's a fascinating because let me, let, me, let me address one in particular. One, one of my favorite Bible verses early on, Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> for I know the plans I have to you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And you see it on coffee mugs. You see it on, uh, inside on people's houses, etc. But context <laughs> is critical to a proper application, correct, Wes? You got a, you got a thought on that? No, I just – I'm – I can't help but laugh just thinking about the, the Jeremiah 29 passage because it's like you get to the end of Jeremiah and it's like, prosper, Jer Jerusalem, <laughs> and everything's destroyed. You know, it's like literally the, the city was laid siege to. And like, I, I mean, if you ever study the, Jer the book of Jeremiah, specifically the siege of Jerusalem, all this horrible things, 
that happened to the Israelites, all these horrible things that Jeremiah saw, right? And so it's just, it's funny to me when, when people take a passage like that and abuse it the way they do. And when we see this constantly, I, I was preaching through Philippians um, and this is one, you know, Philippians three fourteen, right? Uh, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This is probably the number one most misquoted Bible verse in the entire scripture. We see it everywhere. We see it on athletes, have it on their eye black, right? And they're taking that to mean that I can, I can win a sporting event through Jesus right. who's giving me the strength because there's not any Christians on the other team, right? Um, <laughs> so, no, he's praying yeah. for the other team. Yeah, it's so like so, the Dolphins, actually. <laughs> yeah, and so if we do, if we take our, our historical lens out and we, we emphasize, you understand, context, 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 what we have here and what we see is Paul is, A, he's in prison. B, he's talking very specifically about all of the hardships he's enduring. And so what he's saying is, in Christ, I have the hope of the gospel, the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ. I can endure all things all of the hardships of this life that I am suffering because of my, my uh, because of his gospel witness, he can endure those things in his service of Jesus Christ because of the hope that he has. Two very different pictures of that verse. And the only thing that uh, enables us to understand it correctly is its context. So, so Trevor, how, let me address this to you on this here. How, how would you walk a, a member of your congregation who is, you know, got the Philippians passage or the Jeremiah passage emblazoned everywhere. And it's got, how do you walk, not disabuse them of the notions, but cor gently correct them mm -hmm. uh, into, mm -hmm. into a proper understanding of what context is for them? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, what we read in, you know, Second Peter, we're, we're, we're supposed to share our faith, um, and it's often kind of missing from the verse, you know, always be ready to, for the hope that you have in you. Well, it doesn't finish right there. It, it says with what? With meekness and, and gentleness. And so, yeah, there's Christians out there uh, that have those type of verses up on their walls and, you know, they may not really understand. I, I, I remember seeing one, uh, I think it's in Proverbs or it was saying, oh, how beautiful this is. or, or it, it, I forget what it was, but it was really Satan saying that, those words. And it was put on someone's mug. It was like, no, no, those, that's what Satan was saying. You know, I'm like, and we, we took <laughs> Satan's words out of context. Yeah. Um, but uh, to gently tell people, well, you know, I guess I would, I would kind of go with like Jeremiah 29, 11. Yes, the verse does have some some good hope. I would mm -hmm. kind of affirm that with them. Yeah, you know, God didn't leave Jerusalem mm -hmm. in right. desolation, you know, and and He is pointing to a day where we mm -hmm. will all be gathered together. Probably not just here on earth, but really, I think Jeremiah twenty nine eleven is, is looking to heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's that's where full prosperity actually happens is when we're there in heaven mm -hmm. uh, with Christ, ruling and reigning. So. Um, you know, my gentleness is to maybe affirm parts of those scriptures, you know, that they are valuable, they are a blessing, but then I would kind of share, well, you know, this is what Paul was doing at the time, you know, like just Wes said, mm -hmm. he was in prison, you know, and here we, we, we want to read this scripture in, in a position of suffering. Um, mm -hmm. One verse, I, I showed up at a prayer meeting here in Vero Beach, and I just became a pastor. And uh, now that we've got this quarantine, everyone starts saying, well, wherever two or three or more are gathered, you know, but now with quarantine, it's wherever two or three are gathered, but less than 10. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I see it as um, wherever two or three are gathered, it's talking about church discipline. So like I showed up at this prayer meeting and I said, well, it's just us here, but you know what? Wherever two or three are gathered, the spirit's here, right? God's here with us. I'm like, I just showed up and you're already trying to kick me out, you know, <laughs> something's going down. I'm sorry, guys. You know, um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I, yeah. I would kind of affirm part of the statement because I don't want them to feel like they've been living mm -hmm. a lie. 
Yeah. But the other time I, I do want to share a little, you know, well, you, have you thought about more about what this is coming from and just share it with them and leave it up to them to take the verse up or down, whatever they want to do. I don't know. So in a spirit, in a spirit of gentleness. Exactly. Yeah. yeah correct. Yeah. Andrew, we, you've got some interesting notes here on our outline here, the magic eight ball approach, the yeah. daily comes approach, the social, de- how do, how, how are some ways that people approach Bible study that is unhelpful? Yeah. And this is kind of getting your question. And in, in some sense, our goal as interpreters of the Bible and those who are, we're seeking to disciple others is to help people rightly divide God's word because mm-hmm. Bible interpretation has consequences and yeah. we want it to have good consequences, not negative consequences. Yeah. Um, and so there, there are certain ways that people often kind of by default, kind of an autopilot approach to scriptures that is unhelpful and have given them kind of clever names, trying to be overly clever. One of them is the magic eight ball approach where you have a decision that's coming up you have a fork in the road, a job, a college decision, you know, who am I going to marry? And you go to the scriptures and you shake it like those eight balls that used to be around when you know, I was in middle school. And you kind of open the Bible and, and look to see, oh, is there an answer on this page where I put my finger? Well, that's not how the Bible is meant to be handled. The Bible is a story that is unfolding from beginning to end. We're meant to read it like a story, not treat it like some magic eight ball. And the daily crumbs approach is where you, rather than treating a a a book of scripture like a book you go and you extract one kind of devotional nugget and you rip it from its context and it you know it sounds good it can fit nicely on a hallmark card and you kind of meditate on that rather than kind of reading like trevor was saying like read the gospel of john like a gospel read it from chapter one day one to chapter 21 day 21 Mm -hmm. and the social distancing approach is where we are intimidated by scripture that the prospect of having to interpret it rightly kind of overwhelms us. So we just set the Bible off to the side and say, you know what, I'm not qualified to do this. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to keep six feet from my, from my Bible. And, and none of those are, are helpful in the end. They all kind of in one sense undermine and leave us one that's malnourished or undernourished from the mm-hmm. scripture that we need to, to have. Wes, do you, do you find even in evangelical churches using the, I'm, I'm thinking the daily crumbs approach where a, where a scripture is ripped from its context in order to promote a general sense of um, encouragement, a, um, yeah. a morality, uh, anything but the absolute context of it. I mean, is that, is that pretty common now in evangelicalism, isn't it? Yeah. Well, for speaking of uh, misquoting scripture, I need to correct my dyslexia from earlier. I said Philippians 3.14. I meant 4.13. But we all know. Anyways, okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so the, the, this idea of the, the daily crumbs approach, right? And, um, and I, I've actually seen this. It's not just a, a liberal um, sort of church uh, kind of that does this. It, it can be in all different churches, uh, great churches, uh, churches that present scripture accurately. Um, and there's two ways it's done. One is you is taking things, plucking things out of context and then using it to fit your own narrative, right? Whatever it is that, that you're trying to preach from or whatever it is that you're trying to convey to someone, you're, you're simply using the scriptures in to support what you're saying, as opposed to letting the, the scriptures speak for themselves. Um, and then the other thing would be uh, from, and you see this from a more conservative standpoint too, is what I would almost call, uh, Bible scientists, right? Like New mm-hmm. Testament scientists. And it's, you get it so narrowed in on one sentence, right? And so like you're diagramming sentences uh, that you're actually missing the the whole, you know, kind of meat of, of what the apostles are trying to say. Um, and so there's, there's different ways that people do this. There's different. So, but I think the, the main focus needs to be taking the, the text and reading it all getting the entirety of, of what um, of what the author is trying to convey, and then you from there you then you go in and narrow it down. So that gives you the context, the immediate context, and then you can narrow it down and then go and do all of your parsing and your sentence diagramming things like that. So in, in the in the in the context of local ministry, then Trevor, let me direct this towards you. How does understanding the Bible as literature help? direct you in your uh, discipleship 
Uh, how do you how do you help a um, a member of your congregation uh, grapple with some of the literary complexities of Hebrew poetry in the Psalms, and some of the plain didactic teaching in the epistles? Am I making sense there? I mean, how do you, how do you how do you teach yeah. them about the nature of biblical literature uh, to help you in your discipleship? You know, I I think uh, one of the really helpful things is to tell people it's okay to have a study Bible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, I really like the, the Reformation study Bible has little notes. It tells you a little bit about what's going on in this letter. Uh, maybe a little bit of an outline. Um, that might be helpful. Um, not everyone wants to carry around this thick book mm -hmm. everywhere. <laughs> but for home study, it's not bad. Um, with even particular word choices, uh, I use the YouVersion Bible app on my phone. Um, it gives you daily verses of the day, but you can read right through and you can go click on any translation. And um, if you're new to reading scripture and you're like, well, is, why, why is this word highlighted here? Uh, sorry, the version that I like reading from every so often is called the NET Bible, the NET Bible. And it's got within the app, you can click on words and it'll tell you what it means in Hebrew. You know, mm -hmm. if there's going to be something in addition, you know, um, I think as pastors, we ought to be modeling out how we preach is then how people would probably read on their own. You know, topical preaching is not inherently evil, you know, but to stay in topical preaching forever, I think would be a disservice. It would go to what um, Andrew was talking about, you know, the eight ball method, or I'm just going to grab these three verses and talk about this is what trust is, you know, or that's going to encourage your congregation to do Bible bingo, you know, you just pick up your Bible and oh, whatever, this is my verse for the day, you know, and, and that's not helpful. And I think as pastors to be to feel encouraged that you should, you know, go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, preaching through books, um, I think models out a really good reading behavior for your congregation. I also think it says something about the church itself. Yeah. You know, now with this COVID crisis thing, every pastor that I know of around here, like all went talking about faith over fear, like at every single church service. And I just decided to like, Let's just keep going through John, guys. It's all right. It's like we're we're sick, <laughs> you know, and um and and so that's I think it helps us stay directed. That I'm not going to apply my circumstances into yeah. scripture, and I think you know, um, so yeah, that's, what I'm that's good. And I think with literature, it, it's helpful to tell people like you do this already in your normal life mm -hmm. when you're reading different things. So for example, if you're reading a novel, you know to approach it differently than like a manual for uh, a utility in your house. If you're trying to fix your, your washing machine, you're not gonna read it the same way you'd read Jane Austen or you know, a Sherlock Holmes novel. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible has different literary genres that require us to come with, with different tools and different approaches so that we can get the most out of it. So for example, the Psalms is, is a great place that people are often drawn mm -hmm. to it for good reason. And so you tell people in Psalms, don't treat it like you're reading Romans. In Romans, you're trying to trace an argument. Yeah. You're following the, the conjunctions and the verbs and, and the, you know, the words and things like that. But in the Psalms, you're, you're trying to get into the imagery. And mm -hmm. you don't want to take it as rigidly as you take something in Romans. So, for example, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I mean, you don't, he's not literally you know, a shepherd who's walking there. But what about a shepherd? is God in one sense communicating something about himself. And so get behind the imagery there. And so you can kind of teach them those little tools to put in their toolkit when they're coming to a different genre of scripture mm -hmm. that will kind of give them, you know, just a, a helpful, fuller orb understanding of where they are. You, you and I, have, Andrew, have, have talked about this and we can direct this to any of you here. Reading the Bible in a Christ, not, not just as a literature, but reading it in a Christ-centered way. What, is, what does the idea of, or the principle of progressive revelation have to do, or how does it impact our reading and interpreting scripture? Wes, why don't you go ahead? 
Yeah. <laughs> so this is to me, my favorite part about the Bible. Um, I, 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 there are so many times over the years that I just am so amazed at how present Christ is in the old Testament. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing for me, especially coming into seminary and being brand new to covenant theology, uh, you know, really within the last five years, um, I began to see all these amazing connections and, and just, it, it really shows the supernatural revelation of God in scripture. This mm -hmm. is not, this is not just a book. Like it, it is amazing. And I think the beginning in Exodus, right? You, so we'll start with Genesis, right? We have, uh, uh, the promise that the descendant of Eve will crush the skull of the serpent, right? The head of the serpent. Jesus crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull. We have in Exodus, the Passover, right? And then Jesus is the Passover lamb. We have in, in Leviticus, all of these, these sacrifices pointing forward to Jesus. In Genesis, um, the sacrifice of Isaac, right? Pointing forward to the gospel. The, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. We see this in Galatians. We have David. David, right? David, the, the son of David, will rule forever on the throne of God. In the very beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, who, who is the son of David? Jesus, the son of David. Um, in Amos 9, uh, Zechariah. So just throughout the Old Testament, we see Jesus. And so to me— all of them from us. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And for, for, for me, it's, it's not even like having to force Jesus in his scripture. Jesus is littered throughout the Bible. And in, the more you study scripture, the more evident, the more clear it becomes that all of it is pointing forward to the fulfillment of Christ, that the entire narrative of scripture as a whole is about the person of Jesus, about what he accomplished for his people. Yeah, that's good. That's there's a great a, topic. By the way, there's a great book um, worth getting by Edmund Clowney. Um, mm, yep. I think it's called... Christ in all of scriptures? Is that yeah. what it is? He focuses mm -hmm. a lot on the Old Testament, like you were mentioning, you know. Yeah. Um, so Edmund Clowney, oh, boy, what was it? I think I think it's called Christ, Christ in the Old Testament or something it's, like that. It's something like that, Trevor. I have that book. It's a great book. Yeah, so Trevor, what is what is one way that you see the Old Testament pointing to Jesus that, that you, you know, find particularly, you know, amazing? Uh, talking about how we, we, we should be reading our Bibles in its context, uh, look at the Gospel of Matthew. How beautiful mm. when you read through Matthew. This, this was said or done yeah. so that this prophecy might be fulfilled, that this prophecy might be fulfilled, that this prophecy might be fulfilled. It's like all of what Matthew was saying. And, and particularly, if he's saying that, he's talking to, to a Jewish audience. I mean, here, mm. Matthew, is, it's really a Jewish gospel. Mm. Um, and it's telling the reader and those listening and reading Matthew's words, um, yeah, the whole idea of Old Testament sacrifices was to be the one true final sacrifice, the mm -hmm. real atonement, even the, the ceremonial uh, annual sacrifice uh, that the Jews had was to be a once and for all moment. And finally, we see that in, in Christ. Um, himself and so um gospel of matthew's great mm -hmm. at guiding yeah. us this was all done for uh for us to know that jesus would 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 be the final sacrifice you know mm -hmm. that's great and i think of especially you mentioned leviticus earlier trevor that uh, mm -hmm. and I, I agree with you if i'm going to point someone to the first place to start it's going to be the gospel of john but eventually I'd want them to go to Leviticus and even to see Leviticus in light of Christ. Yeah. And so for example, in Leviticus, you have these clean and unclean laws. They take up a ton of time. They're very strange. They're very foreign to us. Mm -hmm. And yet they serve a great purpose. In one sense, they're marking out how God is holy and those who draw near to him must be holy because if you are unclean or unholy, you cannot enter the presence of God. And in the old Testament, uncleanness is contagious. If you touch a dead corpse, if you touch unclean food, you become unclean. Mm -hmm. But then you come to a place like the gospel of Matthew and Jesus Touching is noted, <laughs> he's noted as specifically when he heals certain people who have uncleannesses, mm -hmm. he actually reaches out to touch them. Other times he speaks and they're clean, like he speaks and stills the storm. But at times he reaches out and touches people to clean them. Mm -hmm. And 
it's not that he becomes in unclean. It's that they actually become clean, that he heals them of their uncleanness because he has the power to make people holy, to mm-hmm. cleanse them so that they can come into the presence of God because he is the one who's now bringing us into the father's presence. And then Matthew's gospel ends uh, in this climactic way of when Jesus dies, the veil that separates the presence of God from the people is torn in two. You know, the, the cross being the ultimate act of bringing us into the presence of God and all of the yeah. uncleanness laws is pointing towards that. Yeah. And the, the presence of God even being taking form in the person of Christ. Like I think it was like, as Andrew was talking, I was thinking of in Ezekiel, the presence of God goes up from the temple and then it goes and it rests on uh, Mount of Olives, right? And then on Palm Sunday, Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives, makes a beeline for the temple. So the presence of God rests in the Mount of Olives. And then as uh, Jesus enters into Jerusalem, the presence of God, in a sense, is returning. Is back in the temple. I, I never forget reading Leviticus 16 and understanding for the first time the implication of the, the fulfillment of that. Mm at the cross how can Amen. we really understand the the magnitude of the atonement literally atonement without understanding the purpose of the original atonement to mm-hmm. set people to set people apart make them clean well it's been a great time trevor want to thank you so much for joining us trevor rayburn at uh, morning star church in vero beach west lover my uh, partner and one of my partners in crime here at uh, Cornerstone uh, Church in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, and of course, my good brother, uh, Andrew Jacobson, Sand Harbor Presbyterian Church. It's been a great pleasure to spend time with all of you, and we look forward to being back with you next week for another episode of Presbyterians in Quarantine Drinking Coffee. We'll see you next time.